The scholars in this room, particularly in secondary school, benefited from free primary education. And most of them completed secondary, uh, primary education because of free primary education. If it were not for equity and its partners, uh, DFID or UK Aid and the MasterCard Foundation, these scholars would not have made it to Form 1, could not have transited. For every scholar sitting in this room, there might be 10 scholars out there. What are your plans and government plans towards making secondary education more affordable such that we can have a better transition rate from primary to secondary education? I think the first thing we're trying to do first and foremost is to improve the quality of, 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 of uh, our own institutions and availability of schools in local areas. And that was one of the programs that we started. When we had a stimulus program, one of the key areas that we really funded was to ensure that in every constituency in our republic, we had a school that was equivalent to an alliance. And this is a program that we are continuing to pump a lot of money in to be able to reduce the cost so that people do not have to travel far to be able to, to find uh, a proper institution that is affordable within their own areas that they could go to. That is one program that we actually have. The second aspect that we're really looking into, we need to also be able to see how we can expand the number of teachers that are available. Because as you know, we do give, there is a grant that is given for, um, for, for, for secondary education, but it is not enough. It is not enough. And therefore, parents are having to equally supplement a certain amount. Now, what we are actually finding is that we need to be able to boost that going along so that we are in the same level where we will be able to say that there is free, universal, not just primary education, but secondary education. But James, we must also be realistic as we move on. We need at the same time, and that's why investment in these projects, for example, Vision 2030, for us to be able to expand the kind of services and facilities that we are able to give, we must also be able to expand the pie. Because if the pie remains small, we can only offer so much. If we expand the pie, I believe, as we are now focusing on doing, as we, as we focus on some of these programs and projects that we're doing, as we move our growth to hopefully 10% uh, in the near future and maintain it, we are doing that not just to create job uh, opportunities, but also to be able to create and to have more social benefits that as a government we can offer our people. But it's sometimes a question of the chicken and the egg. We, we, we need to be able to balance the two. Because if we overstretch on one, we may end up now becoming more of a consumer society that really is not in a position to generate. And that is why we appreciate that as we go through these transitional stages, as we go through these difficulties, as a country, as we try to ensure we are able to support every single Kenyan to get the kind of education that he or she has dreamt about, we need, as we walk through those transition stages, to be in an area where we can work in partnership with people like yourselves to see how you can also help the nation walk through this difficult path. But ultimately, I believe we will get to a situation where we are able to ensure and to guarantee that every child in Kenya is able to get an education from primary through to high school and ultimately to university. But like I said, we need to be able to grow the pie in order to be able to accommodate all these dreams and desires that we have. So we still have a lot of work ahead of us, but I believe that if we are all committed to that, if we all believe that what we want to see is a better Kenya, we can achieve it. As the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, what are the three major challenges that confront you as a leader? I think the first major challenge is the issue of youth unemployment. This country has a major, major challenge of a lot of highly intelligent, bright young people who have gone through all the paces of their education only to end up without a firm job or a place 
to earn a living. I think if I was to be asked what is the second biggest, I would say youth unemployment is the second biggest. If I was to be asked what is the third problem that I find as a challenge, I would again say youth unemployment. And that is why our focus must be on how do we create opportunities for these young people. And how are you creating opportunities for the youth as uh, the Minister for Finance? You have, the, you have the budget. For one, we have put a lot of money, especially out in rural areas, for programs that are aimed to be youth-centered. We have done, for example, um, uh, the, the fish pond scheme. That again was geared towards engaging youth and to be able to create a source of employment and has been highly successful in many parts of this country, engaging a good number of young people in terms of their ability to grow and harvest crop. The second aspect that we are looking at is a program that we're working with yourselves, this issue of SMEs, because we have actually understood and recognized that a large part of this country, a huge number of our people, are actually not employed in those big corporate entities, but are actually employed by many small and medium enterprises throughout this country, and micro enterprises. So we want to be able to see how can we have these people access finance. Because through accessing finance, somebody may have a bright idea to start his own uh, mechanical shop there to, to, to weld windows for a school or to do something, but he doesn't have the capital to do it. He has the idea, but he doesn't have the capital to do it. So we want to be able to empower people like that, that they are able to go to a bank like Equity Bank, get some training as to how to manage resources and how to manage credit, get a loan, start their business. As they start their business, they are in a position to maybe employ one, two, three, or four of their colleagues in the area making their windows. We made sure we passed a law the other day that said, for example, we will not, as a government, because the government is a major consumer, government will no longer import furniture. All furniture that government buys must be locally made. That again is an attempt to ensure that we create job opportunities for uh, uh, um, some of these SMEs to supply furniture to government offices throughout, throughout the country. We launched the other day another program at, uh, uh, with the president in um, railway yard where, where they are now making different machine tools which they are selling at very reasonable rates which again I would like to encourage banks like yourself to allow these machine tools that help people go and make different uh, manufactured products around the country. This is again a way of creating jobs. We are investing in these because ultimately there is nothing worse in society than having a brilliant mind that is idle. Because that idle mind now will use its brilliance rather than for growth and development, will use it for destruction. You saw those hoodies in London the other day. Me, I don't want us to go there. I want us to be able to engage our youth I want us to be able to give them hope. I want them to be able to know that they can make it and be great people on their own, in their own country, and for us to be able to facilitate them to do that. Because by so doing, is the only way you guarantee and protect your future. If we don't invest in that, you can talk about anything else, but you don't have a country if your youth have no hope in their own country. Deputy Prime Minister, how do you balance political life and family life? Very difficult. But, especially when they are young. Because sometimes, you know, you can get home and, you know, the saddest part is if you get home, sometimes you've been away for so long when they're very young. You know, and you're like... But, it is a very difficult balance to make. But it's a sacrifice I believe you have to make. But at the end of the day, and even as they grow, and you start to engage with them, I think they begin to appreciate what you do, understand what you do, and so long as you also find some time to engage, because sometimes it's not how much time you spend, but the quality of the time you spend that counts. 
on his side, all of us are wiser. If you reflect your life in school, what would you have done differently so that we can learn from your wisdom now? In hindsight, what I would have done differently? While in school. I think if I was to do something differently today, I would say, you know, people say, yeah, you know, when you're young, you don't have to think about what you want to do or where you want to be. I really think it is important for people to be focused at a very early age. By being focused, it helps you achieve your goal much earlier and hopefully therefore retire and be able to enjoy a retired life much earlier. Because some of us, I see sometimes some of my colleagues, and they're, you know, at, at an age and you're still seeing them working and struggling. You know, but James, but me, I want by the time, God willing, if he gives me life, by 60, 65, me, Nataka could retire and end and enjoy grandchildren if my children will give me that. And relax and enjoy life. I don't want to be struggling at 75 when I can't walk and I'm still calling myself a leader and give these people an opportunity to move life and to move the country to the next <laughs> level huh? and observe them yeah? so you could have avoided negative uh, peer pressure negative peer pressure and be positive because negative peer pressure actually only helps you lose your dream and by the time you're able to capture it again you know you're starting again late that is one thing I would have avoided.